<coughs> now recording and someone's coughing. So um, whoever that was, I hope you feel better soon. And could you turn your microphone off? Um, right, I am uh, I am Luke Bennett. I am um, one of the members of the Sheffield Space and Place group. And uh, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about us uh, shortly. And uh, my colleague Jill Dickinson is going to tell you a little bit about the other organisation that's um, uh, co-branding uh, the event uh, today. I wanted to open up with um, a few uh, words of welcome and contextualization. Uh, uh, and so that's what I'm going to dive into uh, now. And these are the uh, speakers who've kindly come along today to um, present their present their thoughts. I'll introduce them very briefly as we go along. I, I, I tend to prefer people to introduce themselves because they know themselves better than I do. So it's better for them to introduce them, really, I always think. Um, so we'll get into that shortly, but just a few sort of scene setting um, comments from me, really, to set things up. So this session is subtitled Experiencing Being on Campus. Now, the words being on campus in the old world, the pre-COVID world, were completely unremarkable. They simply describe a physical location of uh, someone's uh, emplacement. Um, but COVID has sort of raised the profile and problematized this notion of being or not being uh, on campus. Um, and so with you know recent talk of things like the extended campus and hybrid working and so on and so forth, I think it's high time or pertinent for us to turn some attention towards thinking, well, what do we mean about being on campus? How is being on campus experienced? What practical consequences does us meditating on being on campus uh, actually have for uh, the making, running, using, et cetera, of university spaces? Um, and within that, how can we investigate how staff, students, wider community members, experience a university's campus and what are the ways in which we could get uh, to the bottom of that. So just to start off really with an introduction to the two organizations that are branding and, and, and pulling this event together. First of all, the Space and Place Group um, celebrates its 10th anniversary uh, this year. Hooray. Um, the Shoe Space and Place Group, and I know we're not supposed to use the expression shoe anymore, but I really can't get used to saying Hallam Space and Place Group, um, has operated as a loose confederation of space and place related researchers across the arts, humanities, social and managerial sciences for the last decade. With everybody else who would like to join in, welcome uh, to. Membership is simply by asking me to add, add you to the mailing list uh, and turning up at one, two, three, four or none of our annual uh, events, which are uh, always focused around a theme. We choose an annual theme and then we set up a number of events to interrogate that theme from various angles. Previous years have seen us discuss seaside towns, uh, COVID confinement, uh, the pleasures and pains of domestic dwelling, uh, infrastructure, uh, and most recently, um, the spatial aspects of haunting and, and uh, hauntedness. So we've now turned our thoughts uh, towards um, the issue of changing place. That's our theme for this year, for 2022. Um, and to start that season off, we thought, well, let's have a look at specifically how campuses change. And without wanting to steal uh, our keynote speaker, um, Harriet's um, thunder, uh, let me introduce you to um, uh, did I jump across it? I did jump across a couple of slides there. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Right. So I've introduced Space and Place Group. That was what I wanted to do. Uh, and now I want to hand across to Jill. Jill, this is the bit where I was supposed to say to you, Jill, could you tell us a bit about I, I uh, Herek, or whatever you refer to yourself as? Thank you, Luke. Um, just before I do, I'd like to say a big thank you to Luke for chairing today's session um, and also to Luke and all the other colleagues who have been involved in putting it together and speaking today and to people for attending as well. Really good to see so many people. Um, so yeah, in terms of the Interdisciplinary Higher Education Research and Practice Cluster, or HEC for short, um, 
essentially it's an opportunity for bringing together colleagues and postgraduate students from across the university, all disciplines, all stages of their careers to develop research and practice related opportunities that relate to the very broad theme of higher education. So we've got a remit of activities that are driven by the members um, and we've got about 125 people involved already, which is fabulous. And you know these can include sort of working together on bids for funding, plans for evaluation, developing papers, sharing practice around teaching and learning and professional development. Um, so far, we've had a research seminar from David Smith and his team on research and rich learning. Terry Lisa kindly put us together a writing retreat. Um, and in the background, colleagues have also been working on developing a reading group and separately a peer reviewing process for get, gaining feedback and developing papers. So quick plug and um, before I go, we've got a planning meeting next Wednesday, same time. Everybody's welcome to join us to put together an action plan for semester two. And if you're not already on the circulation list and would like to be, I'll put the email address for the cluster in the chat and it'd be great to hear from you. Thank you. Many thanks, Jill. So um, the assumed power of place. Now then, those of you from Sheffield Hallam, which is most of the audience uh, in, this, uh, in this session, will recognise these uh, views either from having wandered through this particular place recently or from the myriad of um, uh, publicity uh, materials that they're being bombarded with presently on internal comms saying about how great it is that we've got a new uh, space uh, on campus. Um, Vice Chancellor and others positively gushing uh, with enthusiasm about this newly created space. Uh, and the thing that I'm pointing to here is, is not to say that it's a rubbish space or whatever. It's 18 months of hard work has led to the uh, refurbishment of this core sort of axial area uh, within the heart of our city centre campus. Um, but what I do want to point to is how much work this place is being summoned to do. Um, it is being um, posited as a sort of positive image of the university and of its futurity and of its sort of solidness and steadiness of, of vision and purpose. It's being um, offered up as a, a wonderful beacon for the attraction of new students. It's being offered up as a wonderful salvation to the um, repopulation of the campus, the pulling back together of people into um, a wonderfully productive Congress uh, on campus uh, once uh, uh, COVID restrictions uh, subside. Um, and so in also in also many ways, including sort of environmental, all this greenery is sort of lauded as a uh, an investment in both mental well-being and climate change or arresting climate change. Can, can a building, can bits of wood, can bits of paint carry this much uh, willed for investment and uh, uh, and so forth. And so I'm not offering that up as a fundamental RC critique. I'm just sort of saying there's an awful lot of investment uh, being put into this image uh, and this uh, this prospect uh, that's opened up in this new um, in, in this new form. Um, and in order to sort of set up some space for the for the three presentations today, I just want to spend about five minutes. Um, applying the thoughts of uh, Henri Lefebvre uh, to this, uh, and I'm not a, a Lefebvrean expert, there are others in this uh, session today who, who can claim that mantle, um, but many of you may well have heard of his spatial triad, uh, which sounds dead, dead scientific. Um, everybody who I've ever heard explain the spatial triad has explained it slightly differently, so my attempt will be no less accurate than anybody else's, but anyway there's a diagram there, and the essence of the spatial triad is that there's no point just looking at what the placemakers intended for that place. You've also got to think about how are the users thinking about that place, the perceived aspect of uh, space, if you like. Um, but you don't stop there. You also look at what people actually do consciously or otherwise within that space. And it's the interplay of those three dimensions that actually gives you place, that actually is the outcome of that social process and cultural process of um, place taking and place making. So over the next few slides, I just wanted to concentrate on this notion of conceived space, because really what I'm referring to there in this sort of massive emotional purposive investment in, in our new atrium space is this notion that a university can through its buildings 
teach and change people. Um, and there's nothing new to this. I'm just going to show you a few slides of the different ways in which over the e eras, universities have claimed through their buildings to be able to sort of change people. Um, if we think about the sort of classic um, sort of Oxbridge type um, cloistered uh, university campuses, um, they grew out of monasteries. So no surprise that, you know, the original design of universities and, and their campuses was intended to separate people off from the mainstream world and give them an access to sort of godliness. Um, and the, the quote there from Cran is a sort of secular version of that, you know, universities need to look special in order to make you realize the sort of wonderfulness of learning, the solemn architecture will instill in you this sort of academic uh, uh, vigor uh, that would otherwise not um, arise. Uh, obviously mentioned there only of men's minds, not of, not of women's minds too. Fortunately, by the mid part of the 20th century, uh, the architect who uh, was responsible for designing Sussex, the first of the then new uh, universities, uh, included both manhood and womanhood in his, in his vision, um, but was quite um, uh, parental in his, in his view of what buildings were for. In his formulation, um, students are young people who are vulnerable, they need moral and, and uh, welfare protection. Um, the adolescent, uh, the undergraduate is still an adolescent. In those days, loco parentis was still very much applicable to 18 year olds. And therefore for Spence, his buildings are about giving confidence and protection to students. We jump to the modern era, the marketization of universities. Universities are now a selling platform, as noted by Brian Edwards uh, in his review of campus architecture, putting it quite bluntly, the campus is the trading floor and the building is its billboard. And then from a more critical, capital C critical perspective, um, Hancock and Spicer in their study of um, a new library at Gar uh, Glasgow Caledonian U University, uh, argue that the very design of that space and its funky openness that's aping things like, you know, Microsoft and Google and what have you type layouts is actually a form of conditioning, conditioning students to become and be ready for a new type of workplace out there in the world where they're going to have to be resilient, they're going to have to be creative and so on and so forth. And the university is therefore co-opted into producing the type of people that the outside world works, no more cloisters. So all of that suggests the load of power for the buildings that the university puts up and all these effects unleashing upon students as they wander through them are almost a magnetism for these buildings. Um, but applying Lefebvre, uh, he would say, well, yeah, don't just look at conceived though, look at how the users are perceiving that space, what stories are they casting onto these buildings, what ways are they narrating their lives as they pass through these buildings? And does that marry up at all with what the conceivers, the designers of the buildings actually intended? What are their spatial narratives that are informing their use and, and, and dwelling within these places? But it doesn't even stop there because you then got to go beyond the perception of the user and you've got to go into the sort of the somatic. What are the bodies doing? Um, and so really, if today is about understanding how users use buildings, I think we will start to stray in some of the presentations beyond the realm of thought into the realm of bodies. And that's why we end with this wonderful quote from Zhang, that in order to study the specific processes of everyday spatial production on campus or elsewhere, we have to follow the body that eats, naps and pees. But were we to start following people to go and see where they eat, nap and pee, we might get into difficulties. So I'm really glad that the next three presenters will give us accounts, not of such intrusive investigation, but of understanding how you go about getting into the minds of those who are using and dwelling within campus spaces. And what can those investigations tell us that we might need to know in order to understand how the visions of university placemakers then translate into uh, a body of lived experience. And if you like what you received today, there's a follow-up session in a month's time where we're very much going to get to grips with the question of, okay, so how do things and people interact? What are the thingly shaping effects for learning and for research behaviours of things like sofas? So if, you, if that piques your interest, please do come along for the next, for the next session. 
But for today, we have our three uh, sets of presenters and we're going to turn uh, to those uh, now. And so I'm going to end my slide presentation and I'm going to invite uh, Harriet to um, load up hers. And uh, Harriet, you're from University of West of England. Uh, you're in the management school, I believe, but I have promised or, or, or told presenters that I'd love them to introduce themselves. So Harriet, <laughs> if I could end my presentation, stop sharing and invite you to the stage, please. Thank you. Lovely, thank you so much, Luke, that's kind of you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'm just checking. Yeah, um, great. Yeah, all good, right, we'll um, kick off and share screen then. Right. Okay, um, is that all good? Can Luke give me a thumbs up if you can see? That's great. It's That's all great. good. All right, lovely. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for inviting me today. Absolute pleasure to to join you um, in in these conversations that I think are, are really important. It's lovely to have lots of people here who are interested in space and place. So, um, so yeah, my name's Harriet, um, Harriet Shaw. I'm an Associate Professor in Organisation Studies. As Luke said, I'm at the University of the West of England in Bristol Business School. And um, there I do um, a predominantly research and um, leadership role. And um, I'll talk a little bit about my research in, in a moment. So I'm here today to talk to you about a particular project um, that's very close to home. It's actually in Bristol Business School. And I'll explain a little bit about the project. And um, what I thought I would do today is share with you some of the practicalities of what happened during this project, which was largely conducted in terms of data collection over 2018-19. Um, and we have written the report for this project that was published um, during the first lockdown. So that's the sort of timeline of, of where I'm coming from with this project. But I thought I'd give you some background as to, to what we did, the practicalities of it, because it use, uh, uses um, um, Instagram as um, part of a visually led part of the project. So there's a sort of methods part to this as well, which I thought I would share. For those of you interested in understanding people's experiences of space and place, I thought it might be useful to share some of that, the method side of things and, and some highlights from some of the findings I thought might just be interesting. I hope they are interesting, particularly given what Luke has just presented about your new building or your refurbished building. So, um, so there might be some sh shared experiences there, perhaps. So uh, by way of um, introducing where I sort of come from in terms of space and place and all things visual, my research focuses on the material world of work. So I'm interested in workspaces and places and the role the physical working environment has um, in people's everyday experiences and everyday lives of the workplace. So picking up on the Lefervian um, view that we, we've just had from Luke, which is really helpful in terms of contextualizing where, where perhaps people are coming from today, um, I'm very much sitting in the bottom-up perspective of understanding the lived experience of space from the user's perspective. Um, so I'm interested in, in all sorts of workers, so my research over the past sort of 12 um, years or so has focused on hairdressers working in hair salons, office workers in open plan offices, nurses and now students, academics. Um, I'm about to start working with rugby clubs, looking at women and girls experiences of um, facilities in rugby clubs. So um, a whole host of, of, of spaces and places. Um, and this is covered uh, current workspaces people are working in. It's covered um, new working spaces. So uh, those of you familiar with post-occupancy evaluation, often it's around going into a building, um, working with a group of participants, perhaps um, after they've moved into a new space to um, understand that post-occupancy uh, experience. And as I say, I'm interested in how space influences working practices. I'm interested in how it impacts people's sense of identity, their sense of belonging, um, how it changes things for people if it is a new space. And to understand and explore lived experience of space and place, I use participant-led photography. So um, a lot of my work is based in the visual arts-based methods um, part of organization studies and visual studies. 
And this is, uh, for those perhaps not familiar, um, is a participatory collaborative approach to understanding people's experiences of something, most roots in, in sociology and anthropology, where we were researching with not on people. And it's a particularly useful method when you're exploring the kind of material visual uh, environment of a workplace. So largely my participants in projects use cameras uh, or their phones um, with the camera function to capture um, something, an experience of something according to whatever brief the brief might be for the project. So they take the photographs and then we have um, photo interviews, so you may have come, have come across photo voice, photo elicitation, these kinds of terms, where people then have um, interviews and talk about their images and participants assign meaning to those images. So it's not necessarily what the photograph is of, it's, um, it's what it means to that participant. Uh, and we get to see what really matters to workers. And it, and it goes back to this idea of the inhabitants experience of space. What's it really like? And I love that quote about the, um, the eating, napping and peeing, because we might actually cover eating, napping and peeing through this, because in all my projects, toilets always come up. Um, and here is a photograph um, of, a, of a toilet. So um, we can see here uh, some of the images that have, have come from uh, some of the um, work that I've done. Um, so, for example, this photograph here where we've got a coat stand and a sombrero hat on top of that coat stand. Um, you uh, would think it's a coat stand in an office, but actually the person that took the photograph said to me, this is what I look at when I want to remember that humans work here, not robots. It's a really boring kind of office, open plan, but when I see the sombrero hat, I'm reminded that I work with fun people. So that's the sort of meaning that we want to understand from these images. So essentially that's where I, come from uh, in terms of my work. So this particular project on the business school. So as much as uh, so Luke mentioned that there was a much gushing around the the new um, the new building at, at, at Hallam, um, similar situation here. So we had the Bristol Business School and Bristol Law School built um, and opened in 2017 with uh, the vision that this is a flagship space to attract students, facilitate links uh, with external businesses and provide lots of collaborative spaces for people to work together in this exciting new space where people bump into each other and um, lots of exciting things happen. Um, picture of the um, atrium space there on the screen. And um, we thought this would be a really interesting opportunity to perhaps do some, some post-occupancy evaluation work. And in fact, ISG, the construction company of the building, um, heard about the work that myself um, and other colleagues do and our interest in the lived experience of workplace. Um, and they uh, worked with Stride Triglown, the architects of the building, and both came to us with a pot of money to fund a post-occupancy evaluation project to supplement and enrich a, a, a typical post-occupancy evaluation. But they wanted to understand the lived experience of all users. So, um, and they were particularly interested in how this idea of, of understanding the more emotional sensory parts of the experiences um, of, of those in the building. So uh, interested in students and staff and visitors to the building um, and wanted to understand how the building was being used, experienced by these inhabitants, knowing that the building was um, all about transparency and collaborative working and flexibility to be as open as possible to encourage all of these collaborative links. They wanted to understand how had this impacted studying and working practices? Is the building working as predicted? But just to really understand this through a much more perhaps creative and engaging post-occupancy evaluation. So typical POE would be perhaps be a, a survey and understanding rather more functional aspects of a building. Um, but here we want something that moves away from that traditional kind of survey 
and think about how perhaps visual methods could then give us this insight into people, this user led um, into people's experiences um, of the building over a period of time. So we worked together um, and it was a, a real collaborative project. We worked together to create websites together and promote the project together um, and have some press releases about the project. So the project went over the course of 12 months for a sort of a cycle of a year in the building. And, but the first kind of, um, I guess, challenge that we had was thinking, okay, they're interested in all users. So that would be staff, students, and visitors. How will we capture the visual data from those participants in a way that allows us to still understand what those photographs might mean? We haven't got the budget or the time to ask people perhaps in, in previous projects to take five photographs of an experience of something, sit down for a one-to-one -one in-depth rich interview to talk about those photographs. So um, increasingly in visual methods, there is a big conversation going on about how social media can play a really big part in how we collect visual data. And since um, Instagram is visually led as a social media platform, we thought this would be a good, convenient repository, if you like, and sharing tool for photographs from this particular project. Most participants, we could assume, would be in possession of a smartphone. Instagram is a free app to download, widely known. Um, and as the um, literature that's now coming out on social media and research methods, um, we suggest you can create a hashtag for a particular project. People can capture caption the images at the time of upload um, and share those. So the idea was that we would create a hashtag um, and we hashtag my UE and hashtag my UE Bristol already existed. So we used hashtag my UE BBS view. Um, and this was set up. You have to have a public account to be able to share images like this. But we would ask people to capture an image of how they were using the building or how they felt about the building. Um, upload to Instagram with a caption to tell us what that photograph means. So in lieu of an interview, put it at cap put that caption onto when you when you post um, uh, the, the image onto onto Instagram. Um, if people were not happy using Instagram, we set up a dedicated email account where people could um, then uh, share privately their photographs and an explanation. So we created some pro promotional postcards, use social media and lots of other means throughout the university to recruit participants um, and encourage them to share their experiences um, of the building. In order to do this effectively with regards to understanding research ethics and consent and covering all of those things that often funders um, uh, aren't clear on, um, particularly when you're working kind of commercially uh, with commercial um, funders, we needed to explain that actually it was really important that people understood what they were signing up for. So we needed a focal point for the project and we set up this um, website, myuebbsview.com, which is still live, uh, looks slightly different to this now because it's been updated since we published the report but we um, created this site so that we could have a little bit about the project and explain what we're asking people to do a little bit about us as a research team but also to have a disclaimer page in there to explain what it is that we were doing in terms of um, ethics and consent um, interestingly when we were taught and this is you know I, I'm sharing these things as a sort of I think it's interesting that we share the kind of clunky bits of research and the messy bits of research because it isn't always very straightforward. Um, so when we set up this website, uh, ISG and Stride Treglown were really keen for us to have a live feed to Instagram on the front page of the website. So whatever was being put onto Instagram would automatically then be put onto our research website. Um, and this was... Um, an interesting proposition because, because, because Instagram is a public platform, there's no way that I or anyone else in the research team could control that platform. And so 
to be able to then have so if if for example there were inappropriate posts which there could have been and i'll come on to that in a second um it would automatically go onto the front page of our website by doing that and this was after lengthy conversations with the ethics committee um, essentially we are endorsing whatever post there is on our website it's moved from instagram to our website and so and, and if that's inappropriate and it moves over then we are endorsing that image so we put a filter on the front so that each day or week i could go into the website um, behind the website have a look at what had been posted and then approve um, the post so that we didn't kind of get ourselves into uh, hot water there. So essentially the website housed the project um, information, confidentiality, data use, and this is um, this is meant that we could, this meant we could keep everything fairly uncluttered when we were promoting the projects. Um, but so the in-depth information was really on here. But um, but there was um, in terms of the ethics for this project, it was a tricky one because it wasn't something that the ethics committee had come across before using Instagram as a as a way of, of, of gathering and generating visual data. So the guidelines around that were fairly grey and certainly in their infancy. Um, so it involved a lot of conversations with the ethics committee, the dean, um, a variety of other people to talk about what what could go wrong, what what possibly could people post if you're asking students perhaps to post how they're using the building, what's the worst possible thing you could think of, let's work back from that. Um, so, but the main issues here were about anonymity and privacy and making sure that we had protected that as much as we could possibly do. Um, and making it clear that uh, we could blur blur faces and encouraging people to ask permission if certainly they had captured people in their images. So lots of work uh, went around our understanding of, of the ethics of this particular project. Um, now, another one of the clunky, weird, um, slightly unexpected things in this particular project was the um, was the fact that the students hated using Instagram um, and this surprised us and this is something that perhaps we could have given more thought to I think at the beginning. Um, certainly camera smartphone practice now and how connected we are and our understandings of place and sharing our, our, our experiences of place, really we felt um, the, the students would be the sort of digital wayfarers so this way of thinking about the perpetually moving mobile media user always with their phone in different spaces taking and sharing pictures tagging in different geographic locations all that sense of emplacement um, so we thought this would be really easy and really um, uh, appealing in some way uh, clearly, we were <clears throat> very, very wrong. Students were in incredibly reluctant to engage with Instagram. And they told us that when we asked, because we noticed them not using Instagram. And they said, but Instagram is for the presentation of the best self. Why would we contaminate our feeds with pictures of work? Students are now too cool for school. They're not going to do anything if anyone else isn't doing it. And it would be weird, you're creating this online identity and then, well, I wouldn't post a random picture of some chairs or something. So it's seen by these students as a place for, Instagram is seen as a place for presenting this sort of polished identity or aspirational sense of self through very considered images, staged, posted, filtered, cropped, all those sorts of things to create a very particular narrative on their sites. So the notion that you would present something different to that and misplaced in relation to that narrative, um, like pictures of their building or where they're studying or what they're doing, uh, was seen as, as a contamination. So students used email, which we found surprising. So um, the posts then, we uh, gathered all of these felt and lived experiences of the building, this sort of day to day working, studying lives. Over the course of 12 months, we had around 250 people take part in the project, um, around 740 photographs, and these are on Instagram and email, and um, this meant that we could produce a really lovely report, um, picking out some of the key themes that emerged from our visual analysis. And you can visit 
um, the website uh, there and download that report for free if you are interested in exploring some of those um, ideas a little bit further. So I thought I would um, share a couple of the findings. Um, am I okay for time, Luke? I forgot to, uh, we're all good, thank you. I forgot to check that when I started. Um, so I thought I'd share just a few of the, um, the findings that came out of, out of this project um, with you. So the, the, the first is around studying and working practices. Um, which I thought um, some of the uh, participants here today would be we'd be interested in hearing about. For the students, there were lots of photographs that the students captured of the um, the sort of bits in between um, the the corner pods, the booths, the kitchenette spaces, the social learning spaces, the little bits down corridors that just shoot off and have a, a few kind of high back chairs. Um, interestingly, not one photograph in 740 uh, was taken over teaching space. So there are no classrooms and no teaching spaces um, captured in, in, our, in our data. But mainly these are the, these are the places that, that students captured. And they talked about these as sort of blurring the boundaries somehow between home and professional kind of work and private and public. And there's this sort of interesting juxtaposition of these sort of feelings for them, where they describe spaces like this as being homely, cozy, safe, but at the same time, also connected, close to other people, but not necessarily with other people. And probably the most photographed spaces um, was, were the kitchenette spaces. So you can see the student here um, with his head, headphones on um, at a laptop, um, sitting at the kind of um, bar island area in the kitchenette areas. And um, sort of to the side of him, to the right there, there's a sort of seating area. So sofas, a coffee table, some low level lighting. And then around the back, sort of almost where the photographs being taken from are glass doors to staff offices so that's the sort of space that we're talking about and um and they sort of enjoyed creating these temporary territories somehow in and around in sort of close proximity to some of these staff offices and this the student here who's sitting here said i feel like i'm at my in my mum's kitchen only more serious all the professionals around me make me do more work the chair is uncomfortable, but I'm willing to put up with it because of what I can get out of being here. So there's something private and public here. There's some sense of home and some sense of professional. So there's an interesting kind of blurring there. Um, in contrast to that, the ideas about these shared spaces certainly aren't shared. Um, and there's a sort of paradoxical kind of use of the of these kitchenettes so these the the issues that are raised here by staff um center around some other themes that i'll talk about just in, in, a, in a minute about the lack of privacy in a building designed for transparency so the intention here and and i think luke mentioned this in his opening words about the power of place you know and how these buildings almost carry so much weight of responsibility when designed and defined um, in that in that conceived way that Lefebvre talks about here in our building in a, perhaps in a really similar way to yours the intention of the building was to break down divisions between users the idea was to have staff students visitors all together in these very ambiguous spaces in the hope that chance encounters would result in creativity, more effective um, working relationships, new relationships, more interaction and being together and would spark off projects and conversations and all those sorts of things. So there's a huge amount of glass in the building, lots of transparency and openness, lots of ambiguous spaces that were made for everyone and anything. So very fluid in that sense. However, we, you can see the two quotes here on the slide. Many, many um, academic staff talking about the complexity of their work and the actual 
understanding or perhaps um, lack of understanding of what exactly what academic work involves and they felt it hadn't been recognized to understand that they need different sorts of spaces and actually these areas aren't for uh, everybody um, these aren't shared spaces these are student areas outside offices outside staff offices um, and a, a, another of, a, of our colleagues said when we moved into the building I thought wow we will work in a place I can finally be proud of but I quickly realized that this space wasn't for us every time I see students with their feet on the sofas every time I see students rummaging through the fridge and making themselves tea I sort of feel degraded so here we're seeing this sort of sense of ambiguity in this space and and um the, the ambiguity itself produce, produces these tensions, um, uh, certainly for staff. Um, and, and they felt that they had been designed out of that space um, and would therefore then go home to work. So the narratives that we've, we've got from staff really raise questions and reflections about the type of, like I say, the nature of academic work. So our portfolios of teaching, research, admin, mentoring, marking, all, all these things. Um, but that they need different sorts of spaces to be creatively and effectively performed in some way. But this is compromised in, certainly in these sorts of spaces. It, these transparent academic walls then cause lots of interruption for deep concentration work and being visible has now been interpreted as being available. Um, so for uninterrupted work, staff uh, started working at home. Now, to complicate it a little bit further, as an afterthought, so there was rumblings of this sort of thing going on when after we'd, we'd moved in and for quite some time. And so as an afterthought, um, these posters were put up uh, by the faculty, so not by, um, not by designers, uh, but by faculty that says um, staff tea point. Um, and of course, these are in direct contrast of the idea of the vision of openness and transparency and blurring boundaries between users, because now you are defining that this is a staff tea point. Um, but it does show us that space changes, right? It, it's it's um, it's uh, as we settle into a space, we then shape and renegotiate how we use that and, and how how. Um, we try to default perhaps to norms um, when we uh, want to reduce some sense of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty about how these spaces really were to be interpreted and used. Um, but of course, this caused confusion for the students who then said, well, you know, and now I feel excluded. Are we supposed to be in this area? I'm not sure if we can use it. I'm not sure whether we can stay. So we just go to the library a lot of the time because we know we, we know we're allowed there. Um, so it's that sense of definition of a space. Well, you know, I know the norms and rules associated with that, so I'll go there. Um, so that caused a little bit more confusion. So really what th this particular theme that emerged says for us um, is that students are enjoying this space and creating the little pockets of, of collaborative space. Um, these in-between sorts of um, spaces enabled somewhat by the furniture. Uh, you know, we've got uh, what looks like a kitchen and some students describe those kitchen areas as a as an Ikea showroom. Um, you've got low level sofas, cushions, um, a coffee table. It's perhaps unsurprising that they want to kick off their shoes, curl up, you know, watch stuff on their on their laptops and, and read. So it gives some thought around this mix of homely non-work and and professional and this sort of safe and private but connected and perhaps points towards the future working environments that students will occupy this idea that perhaps you know the future workplaces won't be the corporate office um, they'll be working in multiple sites um, in community co-working hub spaces um, and and this spaces like this you know perhaps do reflect somewhat um, the, the the future um, spaces that they will be working in but of course it does highlight that tension that complexity of shared space around privacy and transparency always being available um, and and how much we really understand or how much you know that that sense of um, design that sense of um, conceived space really spends time 
understanding the work that people do and how they do it and where they do it and why they do it in those sorts of spaces. So one of the recommendations that you'll see in the report at the back is that um, ambiguous spaces, particularly like this, need ongoing management. Uh, we argue that um, spaces should, buildings and uh, building management should appoint a custodian for building culture and behaviour. So within the building, separate from facilities, health and safety, management, anything like that. But somebody who is looking at the ongoing mediation and education between different user groups. So everybody understands how everybody works and the ongoing analysis of feedback on buildings so that the building grows, develops and adapts to user needs and behaviours and experiences. So that custodian of building culture and behaviour is looking at that sense of, of um, an ongoing changing negotiation, renegotiation of how we use space and why. Am I okay for time, Luke? About five minutes? Okay, I'm gonna whiz through the next bit, thank you. So, um, so we've kind of covered uh, some of this. Visibility and transparency really came up for us um, as a big theme. Ethos of the building to be as transparent as possible, open, particularly to encourage uh, mixing of different user groups, particularly to encourage uh, the visibility of what we do and celebrating what it is that we do. But this seems to be about celebrating everything we do and making virtually everything accessible. And what does that mean for a sense of privacy, which is certainly something that comes up in my research a lot of the time. So um, here we've got a couple of pictures from, from students. Um, essentially, what does it do about privacy? What does it do to privacy? Well, privacy is hard to find. Um, when we talked to um, students as we were taking as they were taking these photographs and sharing them with us, they described certain spaces like goldfish bowls or that people were window shopping. Um, and this was detrimental to sort of sense of well-being or effectiveness. Um, interesting juxtaposition here, though, lots of photographs with lots of explanations from people who enjoy watching others. So it's that case of I like to see a sort of a sense of voyeurism I like to see what's going on and I find that entertaining and interesting but I don't like being watched it's a bit like when you go to a restaurant and you want to sit in the corner seat with your back to a wall and you want to go out and you want to sort of see see everything but not necessarily have everyone um, see you so there was a real sense of, of um, finding it difficult to um, find some privacy so privacy has to be made or constructed in some way some sort of reclaiming of that privacy um, and people sort of managed slightly organically their their privacy across the building making makeshift blinds out of um, flip chart paper so you've got a 55 million pound glass shiny building and we had a lot of paper pinned up and sellotaped up a lot of high backed booth chairs turned around um, so that people couldn't be seen. Um, and so it's not really the melting pot of uh, different users coexisting, but at times people clearly referring, um, preferring those private spaces and territories um, that they constructed. So really there's something here about the pros and cons of celebrating what it is that we do and displaying the classroom env environment and we need to understand that a little bit more and how that is understood um, versus how that makes people feel when they are seen and observed um, and that tension um, uh, with academic work of of the glass panels on the doors and and, and the quiet work and concentration versus this sort of being visible means that you are available. But it also raises questions that how do we signal do not disturb um, when we want that? And, 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 and many staff uh, mentioned that, you know, it's not that they don't want to see students. We've got the most student focused members of staff in, in our faculty that, that I know of. Um, but when you want to just eat a sandwich or just finish your marking, how do you signal I am a student facing academic and I enjoy that, but can you just give me a few minutes? And so uh, we had people talking about how they would try and signal that. And it was really, really challenging um, because how, how do we read people who have pinned up flip chart paper on their glass doors? You know, how is that read by lots of different audiences? 
Um, and the other one I was just going to, to, to share here was one that was around how the material world often links to how we identify with the organization. So lots of people talking about the element, just little elements of the building that inspired feelings for users um, that then attribute to how they feel about the faculty or the organization, the university. And this ranged from feeling very proud of this particular space. So the, certainly the aesthetics of the building uh, reflect positively the materials used, the futuristic design, the impressive views. I don't know whether you can see there that um, on that Instagram post, somebody has taken a picture of the stairway and said, one year old, 55 million pound building, and then thumbs up place to study an MBA. So there was a real lots of language around inspiration, elements of the building that inspired, um, proud of what the organization does, proud to study there. Whilst at the same time, so I did get peeing, I did get peeing into, I did get a bodily thing into this, Luke, I'm glad. Um, but it ranged also to embarrassment. Um, and we've got pictures here of, um, that's not the worst picture of bird poo uh, on the left there, um, outside a staff window. If you go on to hashtag, if you go onto Instagram and look at hashtag my UEBBS view, you'll, you'll see some other pictures of bird poo, if you're so inclined. Um, and uh, somebody's graffitied worst design of plug there, and then I don't need to explain the other image. But certainly there's a sense of um, embarrassment and failure where the building reflects poorly on perhaps we're, we're concerned about how we, we then might be judged. Um, so this uh, links therefore to how um, people identify and can disidentify with the organisation. It's that love-hate relationship with the organisation and that the material world plays a role in that and can um, and can let them down. Um, and, and so that embarrassment of the, bird, of the bird poo on the window comes from the same place as the sense of inspiration generated by all those atrium stairway views where people choose to dedicate their time to the organisation and they want to be in spaces that reflect the positive elements of that organisation. Um, and of course, it's the small stuff that matters as well as the grand, grand features and the grand gestures. There are you know, lots of pictures of the big grand staircase that was, you know, a real wow part of the building. Um, but it's also a plug and it's also some pee on a unisex floor of a toilet that can really frustrate and embarrass. Um, and, and, it's, and it's bird poo on your window when you've got um, industry coming to your office to have a conversation about a funded project so it's the small stuff that matters um, as well so I will wrap up there if you'd like to read the report please do um, it's, it's free to view on our website there's a little bit more about the Instagram kind of method um, in a, a book that um, I published uh, or edited um, with my colleague Jenna Ward last year uh, a couple of years ago now I've lost all track of time obviously um, around uh, how Instagram can be used in uh, participant-led field studies. And just an acknowledgement here to, um, to Stride, Treglown and ISG, our funders who were really fabulous collaborators because this was a very honest account of the lived experiences of this building and they were open to all our conversations throughout the project. So I always like to acknowledge um, the teams that supported us there um, and the research team. This wasn't just me, this was many other colleagues at UE that worked with us. So um, I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Harriet. Um, just to pick up on that closing remark, actually, I, I was wanting to ask you, and I was dangerously worried that you were about to answer the question before I'd asked it, but you, you left a little bit to play with. Um, as you say, the, the funders were very um, open and generous in, in allowing you to, to do this um, investigation. Um, I wonder whether there's any further uh, insight you can give us about what made them, if anything, made them feel uncomfortable, because I, I sense that in many situations, this kind of survey is launched because the, the, the procurer wants it to say how wonderful everything is. Mm. And, and even though they say, yeah, tell me warts and all, they don't actually like it when the warts start coming back. No, I mean, it, it did open some very honest conversations. I think what was, um, uh, what became more apparent towards the end, particularly when we were getting into the analysis stage, was that perhaps um, 
we as a research team and not all users will appreciate the nuanced decisions that get made throughout the whole process of designing the building, building the building, and then being in the building. Um, and that, how do I put this? Not all decisions are made by the architects and the construction team. Uh, not all of their ideas are carried out. And so there are some quite political, nuanced, complicated parts to why plugs ended up where they were or um, an encouragement to think about how technology would come into the building was made late so um, the outcome of that wasn't as as perhaps the designers had designed it um, and what had come up in consultation wasn't necessarily always heard so it's um I think that was the uncomfortable bit because they wanted to not push back on us, but but to explain that actually that that wasn't part of the design in the first place, or actually yeah that was because costs were cut here and that had an impact there. Um, so that I think they found that difficult, not necessarily difficult, but that was the bit that they were like, yeah, we know, <laughs> we knew that would happen. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to fuse a couple of questions together here. Um, okay. So you, you showed us a slide um, of the staircase in which the, the MBA student was saying mm. this is a really great place to come and study an MBA because it's got a great staircase. Um, what uh, and that shows an acknowledgement of the sort of it, the intended monumentality, the, the, the scale of, of the architecture and somebody getting it. And mm. it was quite expensive to create atrium as big as that. And that someone thought, yeah, it can help me to get my MBA as a is money well spent. Um, but what happens? What happened to the sort of disciplinary identities of the law students and the business students in, in such a sort of undisciplined building did, did did the law did the law students have their area and did they feel law students for being in that area yeah i mean it's such a good point um uh yeah again internal um political um uh challenges there particularly with the naming of the building so the actual name of the building on the outside is bristol business school um, and there was lots of debate about that and then where the law school would be identified um, and, and, and that, um, that, that disciplinary uh, identity, as you say, you know, was, was somewhat lost um, and it's always referred to as, as the business school um, and the business school building. So, yeah, it was, um, it's, it, that has been a challenge, I think, for that particular group and that particular identity. They do have their own places and they, there are the law courts that we have within the building. And there were photographs of the law courts um, as examples of another example of studying practices that students enjoy that prepare them for the world of work. Um, uh, so, yes. Lovely. Um, I'm going to make this a final question. This is another roll together by me. OK, use a couple of questions. Um, do you feel that trying to create a boundless building, one that doesn't have traditional demarcations and what have you, can actually end up creating a building that nobody fundamentally likes? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a there's a danger with creating spaces that are um, are so ambiguous and so fluid and so open to interpretation that no one really knows what to do with them, how to be in them. Um, when you, when you, and, it, and there's a real tension, you know, when you strip away norms and, 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 and all those uh, cultural parts of how we work in particular spaces, we read spaces, um, you know, there's something there that allows for a sense of uh, creating our own territories and creating our own meanings, and 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 that can be really effective. Um, but I think in a lot of this case, um, there was there's there's a real challenge there when you make it so free for all, no one really knows what to do, uh, and then that's where you get people just not using them or large groups of people on mass 
then taking them over to the exclusion of all others and that's where I think there's that sense of designing people out and then people backtrack a bit and put up a poster and say oh but actually that this is ours and actually we're we own this bit and you know and then we default to territory making in and in our dwelling places because we are inherently like that Mm. um and I think that's where the idea of the custodian of of building culture and behavior um is perhaps you know a good idea or something like that where we have people who can help manage and negotiate everybody's understanding of how that space is being used rather than saying we've built it it's open enjoy buy I think actually there's something for I don't want to use the word management but yeah it's a sense of custodian you know we're looking after a space and let's appreciate and get continual feedback on exclusion inclusion how do we feel emotionally who's using why all that kind of stuff because then we can continually respond to that feedback we can't I don't think we can just build and leave when when it's such a an ambiguous open thing with no definition Okay. rambling answer to that but no, no 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 thank you thank, thank you um that that that's given us a really lovely insight into your wonderful projects and and certainly given us a lot of food for thought for what we possibly could whether we will or not i don't know uh do for, for our own spaces as our own master plan works its way through over the next decade or so but but thank you very much indeed and Pleasure. uh um yeah thank you so um can i invite amira now to um launch her slides please So Amira, you'll, you'll introduce yourself, but just to say that you're you're currently studying at SHU. So so thank you very much, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll let you have the floor now to introduce your your presentation and perspective. Perfect. Thanks, Luke. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see? Uh, we can see your slide sort of view. So if you go into play, okay. it'll work. Yeah, it's all all looking good. Okay, perfect. Let's. Okay, um, I will get started. Um, firstly, I want to say thank you to Luke and Jill for inviting me to come and speak this afternoon. Um, I really appreciate it. So, um, yeah, I'll be talking a little bit about um, my master's dissertation focus, which looked at how female students of colour. Um, here at Hallam uh, negotiated university spaces. So to introduce myself um, a little bit, my name is Amira. Um, I am a doctoral student here at the Institute for, of Education at Hallam. Um, and my research particularly looks at Black British women's educational journeys and experiences in higher education. Uh, I'm particularly looking at their like longitudinal experiences. So that post um, undergraduate stage. Um, just some facts about myself. So I'm first generation in my family to go to university. Um, and I think that's probably been one of like the most defining things about my experiences in higher education. Um, so I wanted to sort of, um, I've only got 20 minutes, so I probably won't play it, but I wanted to read a little excerpt um, from a poem by Dr. Maya Angelou, which I really think reflects well on my master's um, dissertation and the research paper that I wrote out of it. Um, but instead of playing it, I'm just gonna read an excerpt. Okay. So, um, we wear the mask that grins and lies. It shades our cheeks and hides our eyes. The debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts. We smile and mouth the myriad subtleties. Why should the world think otherwise? In counting all our tears and sighs, nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh my God, our tears to thee from tortured souls arise. And we sing, oh baby doll, now we sing. The clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile, but we let the world think otherwise, we wear the mask. And hopefully as I share a little bit more about my research, uh, this poem, you'll see how it sort of like meshes in and, con and contextualizes um, some of my feelings, but also my participants' feelings as well that they've shared. So I want to talk a little bit, as I said, about my uh, the focus of my master's dissertation topic um, and then the subsequent um, 
journal paper that I wrote out of it with two of my supervisors, Dr. Lisa McGrath and Dr. Manny Madriaga. Um, and so the focus of this paper was on my dissertation, which um, explored the lived experiences on campus of five female undergraduate students of color here at Hallam. And we drew on a critical race theory foundation and perspective. And we were also inspired by crit walking theoretically. Um, we undertook walking interviews, um, which were conducted to uh, highlight the voices and experiences of our participants. So um, I think what was really interesting to me and one of the first things in, in deciding to explore my master's dissertation topic um, was sort of around the notional ideas of belonging uh, and or unbelonging um, and how that to me most obviously related to feelings of feeling wanted or loved um, and so we I have I started off our journal paper with a quote by Dr. by Professor actually Mark Lamont Hill, who um, in, in a keynote address to the Annual Association for the Study of Higher Education over in the US, asked a predominantly uh, asked of predominantly white institutions, do you love me? Um, and his question was sort of underpinned by persistent race um, inequities and inequalities in access to uni university um, achievements, out, um, outputs and retention, um, and also staff teaching representation in the US and much of that can also be applied um, over um, in our uh, higher education context. <clears throat> so that rhetorical question posed by Dr. Mark Lamont Hill of do you love me to predominantly white institutions or a predominantly white higher education sector sort of remained at the center of my master's dissertation topic and of the paper that we wrote out of it. Um, and so towards the end of our paper, along with uh, my two other co-authors, my supervisors, uh, we sort of posed the question of, as any neglected lover or person will know, that if the question needs asking, then the answer is also um, kind of self-evident in and of itself. Um, and so the voices of our participants, I think, ask an e equally urgent question of, do you want me? Does their university want them? <laughs> So our paper focused on the aspects of love that invoked a sense of belonging, familiarity, and ease with one's immediate surroundings. Um, so I really drew on um, the examples of Nicola Rollick um, and Stockfeld's exploration of Black female professors' career journeys um, that highlighted uh, the ways in which they materialized a sense of belonging um, within the academy um, and how for, that, for a lot of them that was sorely lacking. And so reflecting on such literature and, and the experiences of my participants, our study explored how these female students of colour experienced and navigated university spaces and how this influenced their perspective and aspirations on continuing to stay not only within their immediate university space, but in higher education as well overall. So again, our study was informed by a critical race theory approach, which already views the English higher education landscape <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold, which already views the English higher education landscape as an exclusionary space, um, both physically and metaphorically, um, but the physical part is uh, less well written about anyway, it's the literature on that is a little bit scarce, um, and already not an, a race neutral space. Um, so we show that in the racialized higher education sector, female students of color already have to carve out counter spaces for survival. <laughs> And to reveal these counter spaces in conducting this research, uh, we needed a really highly contextualized and inclusive methodology, um, and in particular one that would illuminate the lived experiences of female students of color on campus, and ones that would enable them to engage in authentic dialogue and conversation, uh, and also give them the power to narrate their own story, stories. Um, so while not participant-led or co-produced, they certainly were centered in exploring their own narratives, and they really Really, uh, led the journey. Um, so because of this, we were inspired to utilize the theoretical lens of crit walking, um, which Hughes and Giles refer to as the walking the talk element of critical race theory. So crit walking can be defined as the act of interpreting and testing experiences, assumptions, observations, and spaces of daily interactions through the process of critical dialogue, critical pedagogy, creative narrative expression, and the act, and the act of resistance to hegemony. So although explicit about their metaphorical use of crit walking in conducting the research, I adopted the fi a physical element of crit walking too on campus with these participants. 
So how did I do that? Um, so I accompanied the participants on four around our university campus, uh, which I kept anonymous, but for the purpose of this, it was at Allen. Um, and so it was our city campus. Um, and so how it worked is I asked participants to guide the walking, walking interviews by selecting a route through the university, which encompassed their least and most preferred spaces to engage with. Um, and it was on these walks um, that I guess the ways in which whiteness impacted the way they physically interacted with the campus spaces um, and the varying intensities of the white gaze within um, our campus space and the exclusive gated communities uh, or gated spaces within on campus um, sort of revealed itself. So walking interviews were selected as our aim uh, for the study was to act as a navigational guide um, of the real spaces within, uh, of the real spaces that participants lived within and existed within. Um, and a lot of the benefits of walking interviews that I found anyway, which are also known um, in some literature as go-along interviews, have been recognized in recent years um, as it really relies on heavily on the understanding and knowledges that the participants hold themselves in terms of how they perceive and interact with their environment on their terms. Um, so some of the findings that I really wanted to talk through uh, from this study, um, there were four, there were loads of findings, but the four main ones that I'm going to be sharing with you today um, are around disassociation and detachment, reclaiming spaces, negotiating the whiteness of university spaces, and performative roles and spaces. So I will get started. So disassociation and detachment. Um, so one of the things that really came up through the findings was, or, or because of the physicality of the walking interviews, um, was sort of how it showed how partis participants both disassociated from the university and how they often regulated their actions within the university. Um, and some of those accounts really unco uncovered both feelings of disassociation and also detachment from the institution. Um, so we've got a quote here from one of my participants, Nadia, who said, I walk through campus very aware of who I am at all times. This isn't where I feel most comfortable and there's no sense of attachment. Another participant, Audrey, said, I tried as hard as possible to limit my time on campus this last year. Um, and for context, this was pre-pandemic. It's just draining. I would rather go and study in a coffee shop than sit in the library. Um, apologies, that's what Safa said. Um, and then Audrey also said, unless I need to be at university, I'm not here. I do my work at home. I have no other reason to be here. Um, and that was really also interesting uh, in terms of how it linked to them regulating their interactions on campus, but then also the ways in which they did interact and interact often highlighted um, a reclaiming of spaces. So participants revealed how they would exercise their agency to navigate away from more traditionally student orientated places and spaces um, towards their own preferred environments. Uh, so for example, we have Safa who feels that the student union, which is a large modern building um, dominated by students, obviously, rather than staff, um, which is complete with a bar, a cafe and a sound stage. Um, and it is a space really that was meant to be designed for students to meet and socialize. Uh, she really discussed how she felt that it was not a space for her. Instead, she took me um, to a non-teaching staff area and an area where there was a lot of faculty leadership situated and commented, I don't ever hang out at the students union. I feel like it's not catered towards me or people like me. And to be honest, the union is just not accommodating to the entire student body. Um, and interestingly, her choice of space was sub subversive in that she acknowledges that students are not supposed to be there. Um, but instead, she says, this is my preferred sp spot to sit in when I need to be at uni. Students aren't really meant to work on the top floor of this building, but I normally get away with it. So negotiating the whiteness of university spaces. The university is very much a racialized space uh, and our critical race theory perspective really leans into that and is uh, non-apologetic about that fact, um, which regulates the mobility of students of color uh, by the pervasiveness of the white gaze. So whiteness is a taken for granted and invisible um, to the extent of it being normalized. And this is highlighted in the discourses around sort of traditional and non-traditional university students um, and who this is synonymous with. And that really shows itself in terms of the way the students reclaim their spaces or detach and dissociate from other more traditional, traditional university spaces. 
Um, so for Safa, her ex experiences with whiteness are somewhat paradoxical and difficult to process. So her hypervisibility as a black woman on campus was clearly, she felt was clearly problematic sometimes, and she lamented feeling ignored at the same time. So her reality of being a black woman on campus was therefore complicated. Um, she says, and I quote, I'm a black girl and I'm very aware of how I stick out at uni. Even a lot of the BME societies I went to have stopped. It's so hard to explain. You feel like people look at you because of your race and stereotype you, but equally you feel left out and ignored at the same time. It's complicated. So I just wanted to highlight some of the ways in which participants discussed how they exercise their agency uh, in relation to university spaces. Um, so the findings revealed how whiteness impacts participants' negotiation of university spaces and how the white gaze particularly influences their geographies and how their experiences lead them to occupy counter spaces within the university. So participants exercise their agency to navigate away from university spaces where feelings of exclusion are expressed. Um, so again, this is just that quote. Um, and a picture of the students union we have um, with one of our participants saying how she doesn't ever hang out with the students union and what really uh, stuck out to me is how she said that a space explicitly designed for uh, students at the center of it how she says that it's not actually accommodating to the entire student body um, this is a picture again of one of our other participants who um, this picture of the staircase highlighting how this was her preferred spot to sit in so this is where a lot of the university um, faculty leadership team are settled so it's not actually for students um, and mainly for non-teaching staff members but she said that that's her preferred spot um, and she normally gets away with working there then we have another participant here of a breakout area with some tables and some computers uh, of this participant saying uh, whenever we have a break in between sessions everyone from my cohort tends to come and sit in the breakout area it can be overwhelming sometimes and you end up seeing everyone and i'd rather walk around campus than sit here Um, that same participant continues, I would rather sit here, so in this like almost, I think she called it the balcony area, um, where she says, here's a place I sit in between sessions, sometimes it's super chill and private, you can look down and see what's going on, but you're not right in the middle of it, me and my friends call it the balcony. Then we have more of a um, secluded, like, booth situation going on um, in one of our university buildings um, and this participant says I sit in these booths all the time it's the opposite of everything I don't like about the learning center which is our library um, and it's not just for certain people I feel like I create my own vibe here and I don't have to fight for space nobody can interrupt me or say that it's pre-booked there's no risk of getting kicked out or being made to feel awkward so awkward that I just want to leave um so again, we'll move on to the final theme, uh, which is around performative roles and spaces. And so what that really, uh, what our participants really um, revealed uh, through the walking interviews was the different ways in which they adapted to university spaces as a way of dealing with exclusion. So while we had some participants uh, report to sort of performing their a certain role within university spaces as, as a means of a coping mechanism, for example, um, on one of the walks around with a participant called Danny, um, she explained how um, she can never really just be herself at uni. Um, and I quote, I have to subdue my personality. It can be too much for certain people, white people. I have to behave different, almost in a performative way. And I know it's because I'm black, like what else could it be? You just have to get over it eventually. Um, and then similarly, um, in later comments, Danny always says, it's these constant microaggressions and I will not risk my degree trying to speak up about negative experiences as a black student. Sadly, it's not just a battle I would win, so why try? You have to be smart and play the system. Um, so we can see here how Danny overlooks the experiences uh, and microaggressions that she faces in order to be part, to be smart and play the system. And what was really interesting is one of uh, the takeaways that we got from the walking interviews with participants and also from our paper was the impact of the uh, how students negotiated university spaces, how that impacted their desire to continue on into postgraduate study. Um, and on the whole, our findings really paint a picture of marginalization. So students often would avoid the campus. Uh, they experienced or shared 
that they had a little sense of belonging on campus and if they when they were on campus that they would seek out peripheral spaces and perform identities um, in order to minimize or subdue their racialized identities um, and therefore it's not perhaps surprising that only one participant out of the five that I did walking interviews with um, stated that they would continue on to postgraduate education with the remaining four ruling out any immediate interest in continuing in higher education. Um, sorry, Luke, can I just ask where I am time-wise? Three minutes. Okay, let's speed through this then. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit then how this sort of relates to some of my current research that I'm doing, which is around exploring the experiences and educa educational journeys of Black British female doctoral students uh, navigating English higher education. And what I thought was really interesting in some of like my um, earlier findings now doing my data analysis um, is in some of the ways that uh, these Black female doctoral students um, have shared how they've struggled in their higher education journeys and how that particularly, and I'm still sort of thinking, I'm still figuring out how this will look in my work, um, but particularly during this virtual learning that we've all been doing um, and how a lot of the Black British women that I've interviewed actually found a lot of respite in not physically being on campus uh, and being able to do some, uh, and being able to work virtually from home um, and how not having um, the physical presence or not having to deal with the white gaze um, physically, but virtually how that impacted their experiences. Um, and so that is one of the things that I wanted to share anyway, um, that's come up. Um, again, I think this really also relates to a lot of Carl Wamp Bhopal's work around um, black and brown um, academic flight. And I would say that that also probably extends um, to the way that students um, not fight or flight in university spaces, but certainly um, in the way that my findings have revealed anyway, detach and potentially also dissociate from university spaces. Um, so I'll skip that one. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. I think I've got two minutes left, but I think I've covered all that I wanted to say. So thank you all for listening. Thank you very much indeed, um, Amira. It's a very um, uh, sobering um, insight, I think. Gets me thinking about things I've not really thought about before. Um, certainly thinking, looking at the questions coming in um, in the chat, thinking about that, that tension between the opening up the transparency um, that seemed to be endemic within the Bristol building that um, Harriet was describing and which perhaps we see signs of around our own campus. And yet what I was hearing from, from, from your analysis is that the students you were accompanying are looking for places to shelter from the white, the white gaze that they feel is sort of embedded into the institution. Um, and so to what extent is there a design solution here? Is it that there need to be more shelter spaces or is that completely the wrong way to think about this? And it isn't a matter of design. It's, it's, it's simply that a building cannot solve a problem that is, is, is more institutional than that. What, what, what's your thought on that? I think I lean towards your latter um, sentiment that it's potentially not a design issue and it's more of a, an institutional one. And, um, you know, it's the, it's the people that create the feelings and experiences and not necessarily the buildings themselves. Yes, I think that definitely does play a part in it in terms of like the way that the geographies are designed and, and, and the way that students move around things. Um, but yes, I do think it's potentially more of an institutional structural issue. Okay, and another question that's come in um, picks up on the, the sort of um, the gendered focus of your of your study. Um, do you think that the lived experience for a black male would be different and or that the survival strategies, the spatial survival strategies would be different for a, for, for a black male? Yes, definitely. Um, and I think I was really clear in not to um, and, and I could have just done black students or all students of colour, but I think that would have been too wide of a net to cast and I wouldn't have been able to really uh, get some deep insights into students' experiences. Um, and so the gendered and racialized dynamics definitely exist there. And I'm particularly thinking, I, I can't remember, I can't quote the author on the, off the top of my head, but certainly a lot of the racialized experiences of black and brown male students in uh, library spaces and their experiences with um, 
security staff members or like estate staff members and being constantly asked to um, have their student ID out and being asked if they belong in the building or why they're here, are they students, you know, being just that sort of like hyper securitization of um, black and brown males. And I think that there's lots of work to be done around that. I don't know if I'm the person to do it, um, which is why I didn't, but I really do think it's an important um, topic. That's great. Th thank you very much. We're going to just leave it there so that we can move along. Um, and thank uh, so thank you very much, uh, Amira. You, that was great. Um, can I now call up um, Amy and colleagues to give their presentation? And I'm turning the recording off now.